Hello everyone and welcome back. Um, hopefully you saw the lecture on the dramatic um, form of literature and you watch the notes about elements of drama. There are two lectures in that series um, because I didn't want you to have another video that was uh, over 25 minutes long. <laughs> so I broke it up into two parts. Um, I mentioned this play Doubt in that lecture. Um, I also mentioned Pygmalion, which is the lecture after this. So I broke drama kind of up into two parts, first looking at tragedy and then looking at comedy. So Doubt by Patrick Shanley, uh, John Patrick Shanley, rather, um, is a fascinating play. I find that people really respond to it when they read it. And um, it is... It was written not that long ago, and because of that, um, sometimes I have students who don't love reading plays because some of the only plays they've had to read in school are Shakespeare, which are not really user-friendly, um, and you kind of have to learn how to read Shakespeare first before you can really appreciate the art form. Um, I like Shakespeare, but a lot of people don't. Um, so instead of doing one of Shakespeare's tragedies or a Greek tragedy, I decided to do a more contemporary play. So let's get started. Um, first, to give you an overview of the play, the play takes place in 1964 in a Catholic church and school. The first act, I mentioned this in the drama notes, the first act is a monologue consisting of a sermon that the priest, Father Flynn, is giving to the congregation. So this is a play done in 10 acts. Traditionally, a lot of times plays are done in five acts. As I mentioned before, a lot of Shakespeare's works are in five acts, um, some of the other classics as well. But this has 10 acts, and many of the acts are quite short. So the pacing here, um, even though it's 10 acts, it kind of moves along, and it's not that long of a play. Um, so Father Flynn is a priest and he's giving a sermon to the congregation and those first few pages can make up the first act. It's a little bit of that narrative exposition that we've been talking about. And the inciting incident um, in which uh, Sister Aloysius, a nun at the end, the principal of the school, has suspicions that Father Flynn has been abusing Donald Muller, the school's only African-American student. We don't get this inciting incident of her kind of making these accusations for quite a bit of time in the play, actually. So um, in terms of other things we've read, the inciting incident doesn't happen on the first page. It happens a little while later. So um, Sister Aloysius, I'm glad that you guys have these notes because a lot of times people see that name and, and they don't know how to pronounce it. I didn't either. Um, I had to look it up. But Sister Aloysius is a nun and the principal, um, and she shares her concerns with Sister James, another teacher at the school, who's Donald's teacher. She's quite young, and this is her first job. And then she shares them with Donald's mother as well, Mrs. Muller. At the same time, Father Flynn is denying the accusations, and he believes that Sister Aloysius is power hungry and against the progress that he is trying to bring into the church. Now, the setting in this play is quite important, and I do have for you on Blackboard a PDF of some background notes about the setting, but I kind of want to go over some things first with you. Um, before you take a look at those, which kind of explain what I'm going to talk about in a little bit more depth. First is segregation. Um, this is a man protesting segregation and saying Jim Crow is the absence of democracy and Jim Crow must go. Jim Crow laws, if you're not aware, were laws in the United States that segregated public schools, public transportation, restrooms, restaurants, and the military. Now, this spanned from things like um, having separate schools for African-American students and white students. Um, it also meant things like, oh, gosh, bathrooms, drinking fountains, um, pools, even cemeteries were segregated. Um, so I think, you know, living in our time, we can't, unless you were there or your parents were there. I'm sorry, I dropped my mic. 
um, and your parents were there or your grandparents and they've talked about what that was like a little bit, it, it's sometimes hard for us to picture. But basically, um, any public space. So as I said, swimming pools, hospitals, libraries, prisons, all of these things were segregated. Sports as well I have in there. So there was also bans against interracial marriage. Um, we talked about this a little bit, I think, when we looked at my contraband. This was called anti-miscegenation laws. That means um, the mixing between um, two races. Jim Crow laws were upheld by the Supreme Court in Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. So these laws really came into place after the Civil War, um, a few years after the Civil War, kind of in response to the rights and the freedoms that former slaves were getting in the United States. And to curb where people could live, um, housing, was was highly segregated um, to curb what jobs people were able to get to to stop people from voting who were people of color and this is a person protesting um, support the merchants who support segregation so don't ban our businesses we support segregation so you should buy your goods from us um, that's kind of you know how pervasive these things were. And things sort of started to change in the mid 1950s. So quite a long time, over 60 years of this type of oppression. This is um, a picture here. I'll zoom in so you can see it a little bit better. Um, this is the the colored people um, admittance 10 cents here. They'd have to go, as you can see, this is the alleyways. The separate entrance for people of color um, if they wanted to get something to eat and they had to pay 10 cents and then sit um, separately as well. So restaurants were segregated in that way. Um, keep Birmingham schools white. We're going to talk about school integration in a moment. Um, you can see this person in the car with the sign, but also um, the the effigy, uh, a person almost being hung or the, the likeness of a person being hung. And there was some violence as well. Um, people who were killed for trying to fight for their rights, Martin Luther King Jr., obviously, but um, other people as well, people who were trying to vote and, um, and exercise their freedom. This is a picture of a man who owned a, a ho he was the manager of a hotel, and in um, kind of an act of protest, these people of color joined in swimming at this hotel, and he poured um, bleach and chlorine into the water. Um, thankfully, no one was hurt in that incident, but it's kind of a famous image from that period because he's literally pouring these chemicals, um, trying to pour them right onto children. The people in the pool are all, you know, 10, 11, 12. Um, I think the one girl they're screaming is maybe 15, but um, that is how harshly children were, even children were um, treated. And the reason that this is important is to the setting um, is because we have a school in which there is only one person of color attending the school. Now, it is up north. In some places up north, um, in my hometown, uh, Lockport, New York, I'm from, it's a canal town, um, and the schools there were not segregated. Um, so in the 1800s, there was the first um, African-American family who moved in. I believe the man was a dentist, and the school board met about whether or not the children should be allowed into the school, because in many places it was already segregated um, before even that Plessy versus Ferguson ruling. And the school board decided that it should just be integrated. And from that point, it was. But in other places, it was not. And particularly a private school where they would be able to choose who would come in and who would not be allowed to come in. And the school in our play is a private school. 
So in 1954, 10 years before our play takes place, the Supreme Court delivered its verdict in Brown versus the Board of Education, and they ruled unanimously that racial segregation in public schools violated the 14th Amendment, which granted equal protection to all citizens of the United States, and they banned segregation. The problem with this is that there weren't any rules or laws in place to enforce this ruling. So it was on the books, but it didn't really have any um, effect. And then we have the civil rights movement. In the 1950s and 60s, the Civil Rights Act kind of culminating that. So that's where you have um, Rosa Parks and the bus, the, the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, you have Martin Luther King um, protesting, Malcolm X protesting, um, people fighting for equal rights, marches on Washington and that sort of thing. So um, President Kennedy had been working on the Civil Rights Act after his death in 1963, which is mentioned in the play in the very beginning. Um, Lyndon B. Johnson passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which effectively, or on paper at least, ended segregation in public places. It banned employment discrimination. Um, however, the struggles still continued after that point. So this is a young woman attempting to go to school for the first time after this ruling. You can see the other women um, glaring at her and shouting things at her. And you can also see over here um, the armed guards who were there to enforce, finally by that time, um, to enforce the integration. Whoops. Now you see all my slides. Um so later there were some um, laws banning segregation and voting practices and also housing. This is another. Um, this woman is taking her very small children to school. This sign says God is the author of segregation. Um, and then a random verse from Genesis that says nothing about segregation. Um, and, uh, and, and then a picture here. So again, I, I want you to kind of understand the situation that this young student is in. He's in a school. The nuns are trying to protect him. And possibly the priest is trying to protect him as well. He's forming a relationship with him, trying to protect him from the other students. Or is the priest trying to take advantage of the situation and kind of go after what what you would think of maybe like the weak sheep in the herd, right? That the lion kind of attacks. So the play takes place in Brooklyn in 1964, right in the middle of all of um, this. And as I said, Donald Muller is the the school's first and only African-American student. So even there's one point in the play where they're talking about the Christmas pageant and um, Sister Aloysius says, we should feature him, but not too much, and he shouldn't just be background. So she's trying to make sure that they're not making him the star of the play to stand out that way, and they're not pushing him into the background so that he doesn't stand out at all. They're trying to make sure that he gets um, equal and fair treatment, or at least she's trying to. So you can kind of see in that moment where her heart is in trying to protect this student. Setting the Catholic Church. So at the same time <laughs> that all of this upheaval is going on in our country, there's also a lot of upheaval going on in the Catholic Church. So after this, and even in part in the mid-60s and then later in the 60s and 70s, there are also protests um, against Vietnam, right? The same sort of, a lot of the people who protested during the Civil War, um, or <laughs> during the Civil War, during Civil Rights Movement, um, are also protesting the Civil War. Oh, God, sorry, the war in Vietnam. I just did a different lecture about the Civil War. I'm so sorry, you guys. My, my brain is kind of stuck there. Um, at that same point, the Catholic Church is going through some, change of, some changes of its own. The Pope at the time, Pope John XXIII, called together a council in 1959. They met to discuss changes in the church, and they they basically met for a number of years, getting together at various points, going back out, consulting with other smaller committees at different churches, 
um, you know, having the hierarchy of the church is pope, cardinals, bishops, um, and then and then the priests. So talking to bishops, talking to priests, talking to cardinals, um, and basically what they decided to do was make some changes. This was known as the Vatican II Council. It's the second council of the Vatican. The first one was um, earlier on and looked at other issues. Um, that is a picture of Pope John the 23rd at the time. So I have a list here. <coughs> Sorry, and I'm going to go through it briefly. This information again is in the PDF, but basically before Vatican II, the mass was conducted exclusively in Latin. If you have not been to a Catholic church before, mass is the church service. Now my father, when it was a young boy um, when these changes took place and he remembers having the mass in Latin. And basically what would happen is that the priest would come in, he would turn his back to the congregation and he would talk very softly, um, sometimes almost mumbling the words of the mass while the people kind of sat and listened or tried to listen. There was also an emphasis on the, ch the separation between the church and the world outside the church women had a very limited role. They could be nuns, but not ordained, which is still true. Um, however, um, priests and bishops made all the decisions regarding the parish. So there was not um, a lot of lay people, which is the next thing. Lay people are people who work in the church, who volunteer in the church, who go to church, um, and they do work for the church, but they're not ordained. So they're not a priest or a nun. And lay people really could not did not have a large role in the church at that time. Religious services were really more serious for quiet reflection, and there was little attempt to make, to reach out to anyone else. So after Vatican II, a lot of this changed. The mass was read in a regular local language. If you were an American, it was in English. If you were in, um, you know, Norway, it was in Norwegian. <laughs> Whatever your personal language was. There's more of an emphasis on community. There's lay people um, running things in the church, so more women being involved in education and outreach and lay people making up councils and making decisions about um, what kind of outreach the church would do, what kind of charities they would form, that kind of thing. And the religious service um, became a little bit more of a social atmosphere. So um, not always um, an organ and a choir, but maybe the pastor would bring in a guitar Maybe they would have a worship band. It's not too common in Catholic churches to have a worship band, but it wasn't allowed before. And now after Vatican II, it was allowed. So that's really the difference. And um, a lot more outreach and a lot less emphasis on rules and a little bit more on spirituality. So the, the thing in this play is that Father Flynn in many ways, represents the church after Vatican II. And he is for progress and reaching out. He mentions like he wants to have Frosty the Snowman in the um, Christmas pageant, which before they only did hymns, right? So he wants to make it more friendly. And he says, why not take the kids on camping trips? Why not take them out for ice cream? Why not do fun things and not just sit in church all the time? Um, those are changes really that came uh, in 1965 and after 1965. Um, Sister Aloysius represents the old way of thinking in the church, that you follow the rules, and as it says on here, pray, pay, and obey. Give your um, money that can go to charity, obey the, the rules of the church, and pray, and sit there and be quiet. So there is some tension there along with the racial tension as well. And again, you know, this is in the middle of these changes. They were not announced until 1965. This is one year before that, 1964. But he can see the changes that are coming down the road. So that's something that I'd like you to look for. How does she represent the old ways of the church and how does he represent the new ways and the progress? Abuse in the church, um, because Father Flynn is accused of abusing Donald Mueller, you have to kind of know the background of what happened. Um, the issue of child sexual abuse was first publicized in 1985. A Louisiana priest pleaded guilty to 11 counts of molestation of boys. That was in here in the United States. From 1985 until 2005, 
and really into today, but that was the bulk of it. Between that 20-year period, thousands of people from around the world came forward with accusations. It was estimated that approximately 1% of ordained priests were involved. Now, if you just say 1%, it, it doesn't sound like many, right? It sounds like maybe one or two here or there. But really, because of the numbers, um, you're talking about 5,000 ordained priests who were either involved in committing the acts of sexual abuse or they covered it up. I want to say this very clearly. Um, this was a pervasive issue. If you um, live in the area where my school is, if you live in the Capital District, there were people who were in Albany um, who were accused of doing this and found guilty. Having said that, um, a lot of the pervasiveness of this abuse occurred because, as I said, the sheer numbers um, of priests throughout the world. Okay, so the, the numbers of accusations was really around the world, not just here in the United States, though many were here and many were um, in places where there's a large Catholic population. So places like Ireland and Italy and things like that. When you look at this population compared to another population of people that also has um, authority over children and access to children, you can see that the percentage is not that much different. So something like, um, you know, school teachers, um, scouts, there was a large problem like this in scouts. It's just that the number and the percentage is about the same, 1%, half a percent, you know, somewhere around there. It's just that the numbers um, aren't as large because the population is smaller, right? There are not as many scout masters as there are priests. Having said that, the majority of those accused had one allegation, but many had 10 or more. And this was sort of um, perpetuated by the fact that, they, that the, this was covered up. So someone would come forward with an accusation, sometimes boys and sometimes girls, and at, at a few instances, um, old women um, who were sexually harassed or assaulted. But for the most part, we're talking about um, children, um, the majority of whom were between the ages of 10 and 13. OK, we have some in, who are younger. We have some who are older, but that's that's the majority of them. And most of them were male. So mostly males between the ages of 10 and 13, which is the demographic that Donald Muller falls into in our play. In New York State alone, the Archdiocese in Manhattan paid $64 million to resolve 310 substantiated claims. They found more that were not substantiated. They found that they were not true. Albany alone paid $9 million, um, Buffalo 8.1, Ogdensburg 5.5. So you can see the number in Albany. That 100 claims in Albany, I believe, came from two or three people um, who seem to be sort of covering up for each other, possibly. So a, a very large and um, problematic issue. The, um, the number of reparations are here. That's money that was paid out. Um, combined totals. Um, I'm sorry, not reparations. These are allegations, rather. Um, allegations. You can see the, the darker color is unsubstantiated or determined to be false. So they couldn't prove it or they believed it was false. The other ones are true. And it, it continued um, on. I will say this. Since that point, um, the Catholic Church has become much better at... Um, screening people at um, making sure that these things do not get covered up and educating people and that kind of thing. Um, but at the time that we're talking about, this is a widespread and problematic issue. So the thing is that, you know, it was first publicized in 1985, but a lot of the claims came from the 50s and 60s. And that is what you are, um, what you're kind of dealing with. So in our actual play, 
the conflict here. Um, we talked about conflict before, and conflict in this play is complex. So first we'll talk about man versus woman, we'll talk about woman versus man, and then we'll talk about internal conflict. If we take the side of Father Flynn and see Father Flynn kind of as the protagonist, put yourself in his position. You are accused of one of the worst crimes imaginable, and there is nothing that you can do to prove your innocence. And people keep gossiping about you behind your back. They look at every little thing that you do. Um, you have longer fingernails. You use the wrong pen. You put sugar in your tea. All of these are like counted against you as being having a weak character. You have a sermon about doubt when, you know, before the Catholic Church was all about um, having pure faith and never having doubts. So you can kind of if you put yourself in his position, he's a progressive man trying to enact real change in the church, trying to help his parishioners. He wants to, those are people who attend church. Uh, a person, a church is a parish, parishioner is a person who goes to the parish. He wants to build solid, appropriate relationships with children under his care, and he wants them to have real faith, not just following a bunch of rules, which honestly is not what Christianity or Catholicism is about, but actually having real faith faith um, and bonds with each other and building a community. Father Flynn does come across as likable and easygoing, so it's kind of easy to take his side. He seems like a nice person. On the other hand, if you read the play and you see this play as woman versus man, and, and possibly if Father Flynn could sort of represent that patriarchal society, Sister Aloysius seems harsh and almost cruel, and she just wants to keep the old traditions of the church. But she tells Sister James that she has seen this situation before. And watch from when that comes, because I think it's a very important part of the play. As the principal of her school, she cares for the children very much. It's just that, you know, so sometimes you have a parent who loves you so much that they buy you ice cream. And sometimes you have a parent who loves you too much to buy you ice cream and has you eat spinach for dinner, right? She's that kind of parent almost. She's not a parent because she's a nun, but that's the kind of person she is. She wants to give the kids spinach and not ice cream all the time. So although she doesn't want seem as warm or friendly, if you see her as the protagonist she's trying to protect these kids from the man that she sees as a monster and honestly when i say that this is one of the worst crimes that you can be accused of put yourself in sister aloysius's place you've seen this before and it got covered up before or maybe it got taken care of and now you're seeing the same signs again of child abuse you feel powerless to do anything and it's not even if he had committed a murder the murder would be over and done with okay and the person would be dead and there's nothing you can do about that but you can try to prove him guilty but a situation like child abuse it keeps on happening and in the catholic church it didn't just happen once a lot of these people had 10 sometimes 50 sometimes even 100 victims so she knows that if she doesn't prove that he's doing this it's going to happen again and again and again now the thing is that the play doesn't tell us who is correct maybe he's acting friendly to groom and seduce these children or at least keep them quiet about his sins maybe Sister Aloysius is in the wrong and she's pushing things too far because she doesn't like the progress that he stands for. And she's um, not the person who gives you spinach. She's giving you arsenic because she's a bitter old lady. It, it, it really has complete room for interpretation. And reading it, um, you kind of have to decide as the reader what you think. I've read this play through several times <laughs> i've read this play through several times and and to be honest with you i i come up sometimes on her side and sometimes on his so i just want to know that you can pick an interpretation and support it with things from the text so internal conflict is here as well man versus himself and we see that first in father flynn he is progressive right but he wants sister aloysius to follow a more traditional path go through him first stop questioning his authority he's a man he's a priest 
she's his subordinate and she should answer to him. And what's interesting to me about this is that it's very much traditional and and pre-Vatican II. And he's a post-Vatican II guy. So he proclaims in many different ways that he wants the church to change. But then when it comes down to it, when it's a question of someone questioning his authority, he doesn't like it. And he gets trapped almost by his own beliefs. And so does Sister Aloysius. So she's a more conservative traditionalist, but she wants more power to control her situation. She wants to question the man in authority above her. And she wants to go to whatever means she has to, to have more control over her school and her students. Again, those are things that are post-Vatican too. Women had more power. A, a nun like Sister Aloysius would have been allowed to run her school however she saw fit. And she might not have to answer to the priest because he's not in charge of the school she is. So on the one hand, she wants that power and that authority um but because of her gender she's held back so she's conservative but she's trapped by her own beliefs as well which i find absolutely fascinating but they're both also struggling with their faith and their choices um they have doubts in some sense um, Father Flynn expresses his doubt in the first act. Sister Aloysius seems like she does not have any doubts that she knows what he did and she's going to go after him. Donald Muller's mother has doubt, but she feels comfortable with it. So she th says things like, maybe we don't have to know. And that's okay. And and so doubt, you know, not just the title, um, but but really the source of conflict doubt in the church, doubt in their God, doubt in themselves, doubt in each other. Characterization. This is um, from one of the staged versions of the play. This is Sister James. You can see how young she is. In the midst of all this conflict is Sister James. Now she struggles with a lot of internal conflict as well. She plays, she begins the play a very young, naive teacher, and she just wants to follow God's plan for her. She looks up to Sister Aloysius and Father Flynn. And at the beginning of the play, she really loves and respects them both. And part of her conflict is that these two it's almost like it's almost like she's the child of a divorce and sister Aloysius is the mom and father Flynn is the dad and they're fighting and she doesn't know what to do so if you read it sort of like that you can kind of understand she begins to have doubts and is almost corrupted I, I don't mean like she's gonna go out and you know booze it up at the bar and then hook up with some guy but corrupted in the sense of she no longer sees everyone as good She's pulled into their conflict and she's got these internal struggles. So she's kind of, um, uh, no one in this play is exactly a minor character. Mrs. Muller is the only character outside of the church hierarchy. So she has a different opinion about what should be done and she represents the world at this time. So 1964, she's almost symbolizing the world um, in a way. The changing world, she's trying to accept her son. He's a young black boy. She wants him to do well in life. She knows some of the struggles that as an African-American he's going to face. And she just wants to get him through school. If she can get him through this school, he can go on um, and possibly be successful. So she seems to be at peace with her doubts about the situation and the church and her son. And she also has some insight into her son that others do not. So that's interesting as well. Now, some people look at her comments about her son and about the situation, and they're kind of shocked. But I think you have to really take the time period into account. First, they're never going to come right out and say what's happening because people back then did not talk about this as much, right? Um, even really up until the 1980s, it was seen as something that was shameful. And there's nothing shameful about it on behalf of the people who were victimized or the survivors of what happened, right? Um, but it's just not talked about. And she has to kind of weigh in her mind um, what's at stake here for her son and how can she protect him the best way that she knows how. It's a really powerful, small but powerful role. Symbolism. Some things to watch for. The ballpoint pen versus the fountain pen. Ball, 
point pens are more modern fountain pens are more traditional father flynn gives a sermon about uh with a metaphor about feathers in the wind I want you to think about what those represent. The wind is often mentioned. There's a wind coming, um, kind of like winds of change, um, which was a phrase often used in the 60s. Um, look for Father Flynn talking about fingernails and long fingernails and loose hips and think about what that might mean. There's a very <laughs> tense debate about sugar. Um, the Christmas pageant, I've mentioned a couple times that, again, traditional things versus more modern things. In the stage directions at one point, Father Flynn sits in Sister Aloysius's chair, and I want you to really notice that moment. It's um, really a moment that kind of epitomizes conflict. Make sure you read the stage directions throughout this whole play. Themes. Doubt, suspicion, guilt, innocence. Faith and religious zeal kind of put in contrast to each other. Um, faith is one's belief in God and in a, um, in a possibly... <sighs> Sorry, um, again, dropped my mic for a minute. Um, faith is a very strong belief in God, a hope for the future with God's provisions, a belief that God will um, in some way, either in this life or the next, protect you and care for you, um, and a belief in things like um, a religious text here, we would be talking about the Bible, right? Religious zeal is sort of that belief taken too far. So uh, the this theme is seen in this play a lot with Sister Aloysius. Does she have faith or is it religious zeal? Where really religious zeal doesn't have much to do with faith. It has more to do with a belief that you are right um, and that what you believe and your faith is correct and that nothing else is correct. And you sort of go to very long lengths to, um, to prove your point. Darkness, light, um, kind of corresponding with the light a lot of times is with truth. Darkness is a lot of times with deception. People trapped by their choices. Innocence and corruption. So Sister James being kind of innocent. Um, Sister Aloysius being possibly more mature, but in a way maybe corrupting her. Father Flynn could be corrupt. Donald Muller certainly is innocent. There's another student mentioned here, William London, um, who might also be involved in this. Gender and sexuality. So Sister Aloysius certainly struggling with being a woman, um, but there are hints here that some of the people in this play might be gay. And um, I want you to kind of look for those and think about, at that time, I didn't even put this in the historical notes, but I should have. Um, at that point in time, it was illegal um, to be doing homosexual acts in this country. And things like sodomy laws were put in place. People could go into mental institutions for being gay if they were caught. Um, there were very well known um, some gay clubs that were raided and people were brought into jail for, for committing um, homosexual acts in public and things like that. So again, high stakes um, if things are found out for people. And power. Those who have power, those who don't, those who want it, those who need it, those who don't care about it. Um, Sister James and Mrs. Muller, really not interested in power. Donald Muller does not have power. So people are trying to advocate on his behalf and make the best decisions for him. It's also interesting to me, too, I will say, um, before I move on, <laughs> which looks like I didn't set that, that part of the PowerPoint up correctly, um, it's very interesting that in this play, the children are never seen. So they're talked about um, and we don't ever actually see them. None of them are on stage and none of them speak. The film version is different and it adds a lot with the kids. And I think that that changes the interpretation of the play. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but I do think that it changes it. I think the play, it's not really clear um, whether or not he committed the the crimes that he's accused of. And I think that in the, the film version, it's a lot more clear what happened. Um, 
So that's all I'll say about that. So the essential question, did he do it? What I'd like you to do is read the play and then the interview with the author. Think about the historical background and some of the literary elements that I've been talking about. And then when you're doing your writing on this play, I want you to develop a claim. Yes, he did it or no, he did not do it. Make your claim very clear. I'm telling you right now, I know that the play is not clear about whether or not he did it. And I, I don't, for your writing, I don't care. <laughs> I don't want you to take a middle point of view. Maybe he did it, maybe he didn't. I want you to have a very straightforward point of view. Yes, he did, or no, he didn't, and then why. And when you support your claim, as we talked about with short fiction, you need to have short quotations from the play as evidence to support your claim. So make sure that you have a very strong argument and that you go about proving um, your point. And that is it. I really look forward to reading your papers. And I also hope that you uh, stick with the class and come back to hear all about Pygmalion. Thanks.